In this video, I will present you a short introduction to finite differences for elliptic partial differential equations. We will start with the one-dimensional case. Hi, my name is Frank and welcome on my channel. What are we dealing with today? Today we are dealing with the very famous Poisson equation, which is a elliptic partial differential equation, and you can see it here. We want the negative second gradient of a function u to be equal to a function f inside of an op interval, which is given here from 0 to 1. On the boundary of this interval, which consists just of the two points 0 and 1 of course, we force the function to take a specific value, in this case 0. And this is, the, this is called the Poisson equation. And this specific type of boundary condition is, the, is called Dirichlet boundary conditions. This equation is very famous because it models a lot of stuff and, it, and can be used in various, various areas. For instance, if you have a membrane in the interval 0 to 1 and the membrane is fixed at a boundary and now you apply a force to this membrane, then you can model the displacement using the Poisson equations. Or, for instance, another very important model is the stationary temperature distribution in a body. Um, here the function f models some chemical reactions, for instance, which produces heat inside a body and the heat is now spreading throughout the body. And um, how the final temperature distribution looks like inside this body, this is modeled by the Poisson equation. And we are asking ourselves now, well, how do we actually can can we actually compute or how do we compute this this solution to this to this equation here? So we do not care about existence uh, or uniqueness. We do not care about theory at all. We just assume oh a solution exists, and the question is how do we find it? What do you need to know to understand this video? Um, in fact, not much. You need to know some basic analysis. You need, to, of course, you need to know what is what is the derivative, um, uh, what is a lambda notation. Although we will not heavily make use of this, and it is always good to have a basic understanding of numerical mathematics. For instance, how to solve or how to efficiently solve a linear system. And since we are using finite differences. Is it, is it good to know how to use finite differences to approximate the derivatives? So let's get started. The first thing we want to do is we want to get rid of the second derivative of the function nu, because we do not want to deal with second derivatives. And the trick here is to apply Taylor expansion twice. We first apply it to u at the point x plus h, where h is some offset, and second, we apply it to u at a point x minus h. And if you look closely, you will see we have a different sign here, which is, which, is, which is nice because if we add them, these terms drop out. And we will end up with this expression here, which contains only evaluation of u and of, of the second derivative of u. So rearranging, um, so bringing u, u, u double prime to the other side, and we'll end up with an expression to the or an approximation to the second derivative of u, which is nice. Um, this expression here will now be used or will be later used to actually tackle the Poisson equation in a numerical way. Because of course we do not have any derivatives on the right hand side. There is also another way to, to derive this approximation here, and this might be more intuitive. Um, so I just present it here in a very short way. Um, um, you, I hope you are familiar with the forward, backward and the central dif difference, which are different ways of approximating the first order derivative. So the forward equation or the forward difference um, is you apply u at the point x plus h and subtract ux divided by h. This is the, it's called forward um, a difference because you're looking at the at the, at, uh, at x plus h. Of course, you can also look backward. If you do so, this is called the backward um, the backward difference. You can see it in the second uh, second equation here. There you are you are looking at x minus h. And of course, you can look in both directions, which is then called central difference. And you can see it here. There is of course a difference. 
The first, the, the forward and the backward difference are just of order h, and the central difference is of order h squared. So, um, what we're going to do now is we want to approximate the second order derivative first by the central difference, which you can see here. So the second derivatives transform to uh, the first order derivative. And now we do a trick because now we are applying, uh, we, are, we are approximating u, u prime or the first u prime at x plus h with the backward um, uh, uh, difference. Then you will end, you will end, you will get these two terms here. While the second term is now tackled with the forward um, difference. This will give us the terms here. Oh, and you can see here you end up exactly with the with the um, with the expression we had before. Next, we are discretizing the domain because at the end of the day, if we want to compute something, we have to make it discrete. So let's split the domain into n equally distributed points and call them xi. You can see the definition here. Um, every point xi has a distance h to its immediate neighbor. In addition, we also introduce the following abbreviation. We want to call ui, uh, u evaluated at the point xi, and fi is the evalu evaluation of f at the point xi. You can see it um, in this picture below here. So this is these are the points we are gonna we are calculating now with, because what we're gonna do now is now we are using um, these uh, these approximation for the second derivative we just um, we just obtained to actually obtain a discretized version of our Poisson equation, because what we're gonna do now is we're just replacing the second derivative of u by this expression here. And if you look closely, because we have split the domain into equally distributed parts, u at x minus h is of course is u i minus one. U x will, will transform to u i, and u at x plus h will be transformed to u i plus one, of course. And the right hand side is just f evaluated at x i, so this is just f i. And the boundary conditions, well, they are easily transformed. You can see them here. Um, u, u zero is just uh, u evaluated at zero is just u zero. This should be zero, and similar on the other side of the boundary. So um, we have now broken down the continuous problem to a discretized version by using by using approximation of derivatives using finite differences to get a discretized version to be more precise. And now we are writing this into matrix form. Um, this looks complicated. In fact, it's not. Um, let's start with the um, with the boundary conditions. I marked them here in red. So um, we want to rewrite this into a matrix vector multiplication. So u zero must be zero. So we are. If you look at this, we have one multiplied with this vector with this vector here. This is just u0 and this must be 0. Similar for the um, boundary condition on the right side of the interval. This is the last, um, the last uh, row in this matrix here. More interesting are the approximation in the interior of the interval, um, which you can see here marked in blue. Um, the 1 over 8 squared, I put it outside of the matrix because now we are focusing only on the coefficients of um, of uh, of this here, so for the coefficients in front of the u's. So we have minus one times u i minus one plus two times u i minus one times u i plus one. So this expression here will transform in, in, will transform into a pattern looking like minus one two minus one minus one two minus one and so on. And uh, you can see here, this is the, um, um, the uh, notation, the matrix vector multiplication of our linear equations. And I want to call this matrix here, I want to call it AH. And this vector here, I want to call it UH. And the right hand side, I want to call FH, of course. Let's do a small recap. Everything we've done so far now here is on one slide in a very condensed form. 
We started with the continuous Poisson equation. You can see them here. And by using finite differences, we approximated to derivatives and got a discretized problem, which is the which you can see here. However, to tackle this by standard numerical methods, for instance, by splitting methods or by conjugate graded methods or whatever method you like, we rewrite this into a matrix vector multiplication, which you can see here. If you do not know how to solve such systems, you might look into my video about splitting methods or into a video where I introduced the conjugate graded method and also the um, um, optimized, uh, the preconditioned conjugate graded method. There I explained in detail how to solve such systems. Of course, the links are in the video description. Now it's time for some numerical results. We want to take a look at the following function f, which is the right-hand side of our Poisson equation. The function f is 0 if x is less than 3 over 4, otherwise it is 1. Um, before we start looking at the numerical results, we asked ourselves what are we expecting. I told you that um, the Poisson equation models the heat distribution inside a body. So we can see the body here. Um, and inside drawn inside of the body, I draw the function f. So gray means um, the function f is zero, and red means it is one. So we have some heat production um, going on on the right side of the body. Um, due to our our directly boundary conditions, we expect or we must force that the that the body uh, is has, has temperature zero at the right and at the left part. However, inside of the body, we expect that the heat is spread from the right to the left in a slow decay because, we are, because there is no heat produced here in the left part. On the right part, however, we expect a very strong decay because uh, we must be zero at the right part. However, we are producing a lot of heat on the right side. So we expect something looking like this, a strong a decay on the right side and a slow increase on the left side. And there you go. Here are the numerical results. And this is the, uh, this shows exactly what we are expecting. We are computing this for different discretization sizes. So blue is a very caustic discretization. We just consider five points. So this is, well, you can actually can do this by hand. This is not a very big matrix. Um, and you can see uh, the results here. As I told you, we are expecting a slow increase followed by a strong decay. This is exactly what we are expecting. So our method seems to be working in a physical correct way. For this example, we do not have an exact solution at the end. Although we could compute this um, for one dimensional problems, you could actually compute exact solution, at least for if you can integrate. Um, but it's easier to take a look at, at an example where we know the, the, the solution a priori. Um, for in, you can check that if we choose f to be the sinus, the exact solution looks like this and we denote this exact solution by u e. And this gives us the, the opportunity to um, draw this error lock here in a double, logarit double, logarit double logarithmic plot. So on the y-axis, you can see the difference of the computed solution u to the exact solution in, in a norm. Uh, and the x-axis is the number of discretization points. And you can see here, we have, a, we have a straight line in the double log plot. And this indicates um, that we have a relation of this following form. So uh minus ue must be something like h over p in some lambda notation with some p greater than zero. And this is super nice. Um, and in addition, we see that we have uh, conversions, conversions, at least for, for this example. Okay, so let's do a short outlook or a small recap. Um, we move from a continuous problem to a discretized version and we also found some good indicators for a good convergence rate. Uh, what we're going to do next is we will extend this technique of finite differences to more complex problems. In fact, 
um, to more complex boundary conditions, to more um, um, to more other terms involved in the partial differential equation. And of course, we want to move this, this method to a higher dimension because computing in one dimension is quite easy and quite boring. The interesting stuff happens in two or even three dimensions. So stay tuned, have fun and cheers.